Hey y'all, let's talk about linearity of expectation. Now I expect that you have seen linearity of expectation before if you're taking this class, but it is super useful and we're going to use it a bunch. So it's a good time for a quick refresher and also to see some examples about how it can be super useful. So let's get started. Okay, so what is linearity of expectation? If we're given some random variables, and let's say they're called x1, x2, up to xn, and we also have some scalars, uh, let's call them a1, a2, up to an, so these could just be like numbers, then the expectation of the weighted sum of these random variables, that is a1, x1, plus a2, x2, plus dot dot dot, plus an, xn, is just equal to the weighted sum of the expectations. That is, this is equal to a1 times the expectation of x1, plus a2 times the expectation of x2, plus dot dot dot, plus a n times the expectation of x n. So this is pretty straightforward, you've seen it before, but it can be really, really useful. So what I want to do in this short video is to talk about a few examples of how this can be really useful. So here's a first example. Suppose that g is a deregular bipartite graph with n vertices on each side. So here's an example of G. So there are n vertices on this side and on this side. And by deregular, I mean that every vertex has degree D coming out. So this particular example is two regular. Every vertex has two edges coming out. Now let's say that half the vertices on the left over here are gray and half are red. Um, actually, let's call this left-hand side L and the right-hand side R. I'm going to consider the following random variable. Let's choose a random vertex on the right, and let's call it V. Then I'm going to count of V's neighbors how many of them are red. In this particular example, uh, V has a gray neighbor here and a gray neighbor here, no red neighbors. So in this case, this random variable would be zero. If I were to choose a different V, for example, this V, then one of V's neighbors is red. So the random variable would have value one. And I just want to know what is the expectation of this random variable? That is, what is the expected number of red neighbors of a randomly selected vertex V on the right hand side? So we can write down the expected number of red neighbors of V. This is the expectation over V. So one way to do this, is just to use the definition of expectation. By definition, this is the sum over all vertices v on the right hand side times 1 over n times the number of red neighbors of v. But at first glance, it might not be entirely obvious how to analyze this, right? Like if I'm just going to take this sum at face value, then I just have to go through every single vertex v here and figure out what is this thing. So this one has zero red neighbors, this one has one red neighbor, this one has one red neighbor, and so on, uh, which does not seem like a particularly scalable solution. So instead, we're not going to do that. Let's erase that. Instead, we're going to use linearity of expectation. So what we're going to do instead is write the number of red neighbors of V as a sum. So this is the sum over all W vertices on the left-hand side that happen to be red, times the indicator random variable, which is one if W is a neighbor of V. Actually, for shorthand, I'm just gonna write that uh, WV is in E, the edge set of my graph. Okay, so now we can apply linearity of expectation. We'll move the expectation inside. The expected value of uh, indicator random variable is just the probability that that event occurs. So this is going to be the sum of W and L, which is red, of the probability uh, that WV is an edge. Okay, what is this probability? Uh, so basically we're saying let's fix some W. How about this one? This is W. And then we're going to say, what is the probability that when we pick a random vertex V on the right hand side, we happen to pick a neighbor of W? Well, there are two neighbors of W, in this case, these two, or in more generally, there are D neighbors of W, and there are N possible neighbors I could have picked. So this probability is just equal to D over N. So this is the sum of W in L that happens to be red 
times d over n. All right, this is a very easy sum to take. How many things are in the sum? Well, there's n over 2 because half of the vertices in L are red. So this is n over 2 times d over n, which is equal to d over 2. So now we have our answer. We expect a number of red neighbors of v uh, is exactly d over 2. So this might not be so surprising. After all, half of the vertices were red. But it does give an example of how to use linearity of expectation to very cleanly show this fact. So let's move on to example two. So this is an example you might have seen before. The question is, what is the expected number of p bias coin flips until you flip a heads? So that is, suppose I'm sitting here flipping coins, I flip my first coin, I get tails, I flip my second coin, I get tails, third coin, I get heads. And in this case, I'd say that my, the value of my random variable is 3. And I just want to know what is the expected value of this random variable. So some jargon, uh, you might have seen this before. This number, the number of p-biased coin flips until you flip a head, is distributed like a geometric random variable. And just as before, we can calculate the expected value of a geometric random variable by writing out the definition of expectation and taking a big nasty sum. But we can also do it very slickly with linearity of expectation. So let's work this out. What is the expected number of p-biased coin flips until you get a heads? So you might already know that the answer is going to be 1 over p, uh, but let's, let's see this rigorously. So first, just to be super clear, let's define a random variable that we want to think about. So let x sub i equal the number of p-biased coin flips until heads, starting with flip i. So the thing we're interested in is the expected value of x1, the number of p-biased coin flips until you get a head, starting with the first flip. So there are multiple sources of randomness here. There's the source of randomness in the first flip, in the second flip, in the third flip, and so on. So let's break up this expectation over those different sources of randomness. I'm first going to consider the expectation over the randomness of the first flip, and then the expectation over the rest of the flips of x sub 1. So now I can just use the definition of expectation just as it applies to the randomness in the first flip. So that is, I'm just going to consider this thing. And I can write the expectation over flips greater than or equal to 2 of, well, OK, what is this expectation? Well, with probability p, I flip a head. If I flip heads, then the number of p-bias coin flips before I flipped heads, starting with flip 1, was 1. I got it on the first try. So this random variable would have value 1. On the other hand, with probability 1 minus p, this value is going to be, okay, 1 for the tails that I just flipped, plus however many coin flips it's going to take me to get to get a heads, starting with flip 2. That's x sub 2. Okay, now we can use linearity of expectation. This is maybe a little bit of a degenerate example because I only have one random variable, but let's still call it that because uh, then it fits nicely into this little video. So this is equal to p plus 1 minus p times 1 plus the expected value for flips greater than or equal to 2 of x2. And what is this random variable here? Well, this is just saying how many times do I have to flip a coin until I get heads, starting with flip 2. Okay, it doesn't really matter if I call the first one 2 or if I call the first one 1 or if I call the first one 75. This is just the same thing as how many times do I, am I going to flip a coin until I get heads, which is just x1 again. So this thing is just going to be equal to p plus 1 minus p times 1 plus the expected value of x1. So now we have this nice equation in the expected value of x1, taking this all together. So let's write it over here. What do we have? We have the expected value of x1 is equal to p plus 1 minus p times 1 minus the expected value of x1. Okay, so let's just solve this for x1. So uh, moving x1 to the left, algebra is hard, I get 
p times the expected value of x1 is equal to 1. Dividing both sides by p, I get the expected value of x1 is equal to 1 over p. Great. So this is what we expected to get. Hooray. And we never had to take any nasty sums. So the third example that I'm just going to talk about extremely briefly, um, I'm actually not even going to talk about it, is the analysis of quicksort. So you might have seen quicksort before and its analysis in CS161. I'm not going to talk about it in this short video. There's a, a short exposition of it in the lecture notes, which you can take a look at, or you can look back to your notes from CS161 or wherever you first learned about quicksort. Quicksort is another really nice example of how you can use linearity of expectation to understand the expected value of a complicated random variable, in this case, the running time of some randomized algorithm, by writing it as the sum of a bunch of easier to understand random variables. In this case, it's uh, the sum of the indicator random variables of whether any two items are ever compared. Uh, so if you haven't seen quicksort before, or even if you have, I encourage you to check out those lecture notes and refresh your memory and uh, appreciate how linearity of expectation is coming into the picture. So the moral of the story is that linearity of expectation is extremely useful. And one way to analyze the expectation of a complicated random variable is to break it down as the sum of random variables that are easier to analyze. And we're going to be doing that a whole bunch. Thanks for watching.